Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. And thank you, Tricia, for the introduction. Um, and I want to also thank uh, the American Center for Mongolian Studies for uh, hosting me, helping me, everything that they've done to make all of my progress here possible. Uh, just to reiterate, my name is Talia Stokes. I am a PhD student at the University of Chicago in ethnomusicology. I am more or less from Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I am a uh, professional musician. Uh, I play double bass. I've been playing double bass uh, in orchestra for about 17 years. So what is my project? Uh, I am studying or researching the hip hop culture scene among Mongols in Mongolia and in China. And uh, how this came about is that in my bachelor's uh, studies, I started studying Chinese um, and I studied for two years and then I went to Beijing for six months to do intensive language study uh, in 2009. At that time I came to, uh, it's fine, this is intentional. At, <laughs> at that time, I came to learn about uh, so-called ethnic minorities in China. That would be like Mongolians, Uyghurs, Tibetans, etc. And I became extremely interested and fascinated by this, their culture and their music and this topic. And so I decided to do my, uh, my bachelor's honors thesis on studying the traditional music of ethnic minorities in China. Um, in the summer of 2011, I went back to China going to several cities. Uh, to complete this research. I w went from uh, Beijing to Chengdu, Lhasa, Xi'an, Yintuan, uh, Hohot, Urumqi, Kashgar, uh, back to Beijing, went to uh, Shaoxing, and then ended the trip in Shanghai. Uh, I took three months to do that trip, and I was traveling all over China by plane, train, uh, buggy, horse and cart, you name it, I traveled it. Uh, trying to do this kind of research uh, to understand the traditional music of ethnic minorities in China. Uh, at, after or during the course of the research, I became extremely or particularly interested in Tibetan and Mongolian traditional music. Uh, so continuing on with that, after I finished my bachelor's, I moved straight into my master's research. I decided to narrow the focus of my bachelor's thesis to studying specifically uh, traditional Mongolian music as opposed to the uh, musics of several different ethnic minorities in China. So I went back to China again in 2012 uh, to Hohut in Inner Mongolia. At, by this point, this would have been my fifth time in China. Um, and I studied traditional Mongolian music. During my research, many things stood out to me. Uh, but two things lodged per particularly into my memory. First was Mongolian hip hop. At the time, I was completely unaware how popular hip hop was outside of not only uh, just the United States, but particularly in East Asia, as far flung from the major city centers in China as Hohut or Western China. This was something that was completely unknown to me at the time. So when I was doing my research, I interviewed a young guy who uh, was ethnic, ethnically Mongolian and he had uh, his own hip hop music crew and he did beatboxing. When I interviewed him, I was completely blown away. That was the first thing that lodged into my mind. The second thing that lodged into my mind was learning about the particular relationship between Mongols in Mongolia and Mongols in China. So what do I mean by that? Uh, one of the people that I interviewed was a young Mongolian woman 
who was a professional musician from Mongolia. She's, she's not a Chinese citizen, she was a Mongolian citizen. And she happened to be in Khohat with her husband, who was also a professional musician. During the, or right before the interview started, we had had kind of a small, sort of small talk conversation where we were just trying to get to know each other. And during that conversation, it became apparent to me that she had some kind of, I guess you could say, a sort of hostility towards uh, China, towards Chinese culture, et cetera. And when I was asking her through the course of the interview uh, what differences she could name or think of between Mongolian music in Mongolia and traditional Mongolian music in China, she was very prideful in saying, you know, we Mongolians have the real Mongolian music. The Mongolian music in China is not real Mongolian music, it's too Chinese influenced. And that was her position at the at the beginning of the interview. However, as things moved forward and I asked her more pointed questions and we really got to know each other, her position softened and I got the sense that I was getting the real, her true self and how she really felt about things. And uh, this is a quote from that interview. Quote, I want to say, we are Mongolian nations, inner and outer. We are the same humans, but we have a different culture. That's why our music is a little bit different but inside we are human, we are Mongolians, we know about cultural habits and lifestyle, even if there may be some cultural differences. So by, towards the end of the interview, she was saying, yeah, there are some cultural differences, yeah, I might have some kind of beef with China, but really, we're all Mongolians. We really are like one people. And so these two particular points really stuck with me uh, throughout the research. Moving on to my PhD work, by the time I got to the University of Chicago, these two things stayed in my mind and then came to the fore when I came across the film Mongolian Bling. Uh, it's a documentary about Mongolian hip hop. Uh, I came across this film as part of uh, research for a term paper where uh, I was writing a sort of hypothetical proposal for ethnographic field work um, that I would like to do at some point. At this point, I had an, a different idea for what I wanted to do for my dissertation, but I decided that I would try to test myself to see if I could come up with a compelling uh, research proposal for researching Mongolian hip hop. Ironically, or interestingly enough, the film Mongolian Bling uh, was produced in the same year, 2012, that I was in Hohat doing research. So interesting coincidence. Over the next few years, I continued researching hip hop in general and Mongolian hip hop specifically. I learned some Mongolian and eventually I made my way here to Ulaanbaatar in July. So for this project, who am I talking to? I'm talking to Mongols in Ulaanbaatar and in Khokhot, Mongols here in Mongolia and Mongols in China, teens and adults, all levels of engagement with hip hop. I'm trying to get a very broad perspective of hip hop culture, not just from a few specialized uh, views. Overall, what I'm looking for is not just an understanding of the hip hop culture among Mongols in each of these two, uh, two distinct places, but an understanding of how both cultures interact with each other and affect the relationship dynamic between each other. I wanna know what role hip hop plays in this relationship. I suspect, based on the research that I've already done, research that I've done in the past, I suspect that hip hop does more for improving this relationship than other forms of foreign musics. However, I don't know that that is the case, hence why I'm here doing this research. That said, for this particular talk, what I'm going to focus on for you all is talking about what I've learned so far uh, questions I still have about hip hop culture in Mongolia and what I'll be continuing to do while I'm still here uh, conducting research. So before getting into hip hop culture in Mongolia, it's really important to understand hip hop culture as it originated in uh, the United States. So hip hop started in the US in the Bronx, New York in the late 1970s. How this happened was that due to a variety of factors. Uh, one was the change in disco culture in the United States. During this time, uh, disco started becoming less and less underground movement and more and more commercialized and formulaic. 
uh, to the point where black Americans started to feel pushed out in the disco culture and they didn't really identify with it anymore. This was a process that was happening in the late 70s uh, in New York. Also during this time in this area, there was a destabilization of uh, neighborhoods, especially low income neighborhoods, due to a, a reduction in public housing funding and also the introduction of certain uh, classes of really hard drugs and the, therefore an increase in crime. What this means is that uh, black Americans were leaving the disco halls but weren't necessarily feeling safe in their homes to uh, enjoy themselves. So they went out into the streets, they went out into schoolyards and parks and playgrounds and they would put together these sound systems to play records and get people to dance. Um, dance and have fun, especially in especially in terms of trying to keep kids out of gangs and out of trouble and off the street, coming into the dance party, this block party, to really have a good time. Uh, with the sound uh, speaker systems that I just mentioned, this is actually inspired from Jamaican dance hall. Uh, Jamaican dance hall culture at this time had really developed a community around um, putting together sophisticated sound speaker systems. And so with that, there was also a phenomenon in Jamaican dance hall where you would have a sort of master of ceremonies type person who would toast over uh, looped music that's playing through uh, the speakers. What toasting means in this context is speaking in rhyme and rhythm in effort to get the crowd hype and excited and ready to dance. So you can see how this toasting uh, influence merges into what we understand as early hip hop. Um, there were also a lot of other Caribbean and Latin American influences in early hip hop just because of the nature, uh, the multicultural nature of New York City, the Bronx at the time. So as I said, black movers and shakers were leaving the disco halls for the schoolyards, for the block parties. Uh, implementing all of these different cultural aspects to create a new thing. By the way, one of the main godfathers of hip hop was Africa Bambata and his group, the Zulu Nation, that's him there. And the reason why I bring him up is he's the one who, he is the one who is credited for inventing the definition of hip hop culture in terms of four main elements, which I will talk about later. So I want to demonstrate very quickly the musical elements of early hip hop that I just mentioned uh, by looking at one of the earliest and most well-known songs in hip hop, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, the music from Rapper's Delight was sampled from Good Times by the disco group Chic. So first, I want you all to listen to uh, Chic. And so with that sound lodged in your head, now I want you all to listen to Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. The Sugar Hill Gang rapped, remember toasting, over the dance break in good times. The dance break being the section of the music that where the singers drop out and it's sort of like an instrumental solo section. It's just for showing, showcasing the instruments and also for getting the crowd to dance and hype. This is what the dance break is. Uh, it, 
the Sugar Hill Gang also added uh, some Caribbean musical elements at the beginning of the song. And you're going to hear that. It's a cowbell with a distinctly Latin beat. Um, this kind of beat. Thus, in Rapper to the Light, you experience the disco element, the sampling element, the Caribbean influences that made up early hip hop. So you hear him toasting or rapping, trying to get the crowd to dance boogie, hip hop, and all this stuff to the music. So during the hip hop's early years, it developed from just music to an entire lifestyle with four main elements. Uh, that would be b-boy, b-girl, i.e. break dancing, uh, MC, which means master of ceremonies, um, DJ, which is disc jockey, and graffiti, which is spray paint uh, visual art. So for B-Boy and B-Girl, like I said, this is a break dance, the break dancing element of hip hop culture. Uh, for the master of ceremonies, their job is, as you just saw, to kind of toast, to rap over the music, to get the crowd to dance and have fun. The DJ, their job is to mix uh, Com uh, compatible samples of music that will help continue or make sure that the party continues on for an ex extended period of time with a nice good flow. Uh, in the early years of hip hop, DJs or really pr um, prominent DJs are, were well known for going to record shops and digging through crates and crates and crates of records to find the perfect music to put together to sample to make a good like, party element. Hip hop became more popular. As it became more popular, MCs, the master of ceremonies, would started shifting away from just hyping the crowd to actually focusing more on rapping about their daily life issues. So by the early 90s, uh, the prominence of disc jockeys uh, started to fall. Uh, the prominence of MCs started to change from hyping to the grit of black inner city life. Thus, at this point, this is where ga gangster rap is uh, uh, born. Also by this time, uh, an element of East Coast, West Coast uh, dichotomy slash feud was created. Um, East Coast being New York and West Coast being California. The most famous representatives of each coast are Biggie Smalls or the notorious uh, B.I.G. who comes from New York and Tupac Shakur who uh, represents California, both of whom died in the late 90s. So in terms of East Coast style rap music at this time in the early 90s, musically, it's more, there's more emphasis on hyper-processed sounds. And what I mean by that is that it's, you can definitely hear that someone put this sound through a machine, either a computer or some kind of mixing machine, so that the natural sounds sound more gritty, more textured. You're, and I'll give you a few seconds to look over these lyrics, and then we're going to listen to Big Papa, uh, one of Biggie's most famous songs from 1994.
So that is East Coast rap. Now we're going to move to an example of West Coast rap. Musically, West Coast rap has more emphasis on bass, uh, the bass sound of the music, and you're going to hear that. The reason for this is that West Coast rap was starting to develop uh, in relation to and with specific uh, context in mind, that is the car culture that was developing in California. Um, the sound systems made for cars. Uh, West Coast rappers were starting to mix their music that would such, in such a way that it would play much better in cars. So again, I'll give you a few seconds to look through, just skim through some of these lyrics, and then I'll play the music. Um, by the way, this song is Two of America's Most Wanted by Tupac featuring Snoop Dogg. It was produced in 1996. Hear the bass. In the late 90s, there was a dip in hip hop popular popularity among the black community as the style started being co-opted by major record labels and thus commercialized and mass produced in a very similar way that disco culture started become, becoming less pro popular among the black community. Um, also during this time, it was when hip hop starts being exported to other countries like, uh, or other uh, places outside of the United States like Latin America, Africa, Europe, in East Asia, including Mongolia. Um, by the 2000s, however, there was a significant hip hop revival, especially with the rise of Dirty South rap. And so Dirty South rap um, was rap music coming mainly from the southeastern um, area of the United States, particularly from Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, etc. The Dirty South rap Locus was most definitely Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm more or less from. Um, artists from the Dirty South rap style, like Ludacris and Outkast, were intentionally carving out a space in the whole East Coast, West Coast feud. So, so they were trying to show uh, the general American public that there was more to rap and hip hop besides what's coming out of California and what's coming out of New York. Trap music comes from Dirty South rap music. Um, and over the course of the presentation, I'll explain how that happens. One of the single most iconic examples of Dirty South rap is the song Crank That by Soldier Boy um, that was produced in 2007. It became a major internet uh, sensation, one of the first of its kind to do what it did in terms of YouTube views, people doing their own remixes to it, creating dances and doing the dances and all these kinds of things. Some of the hallmarks of Dirty South rap are lots of bass, lots and lots of bass. So we're talking not just the volume of the bass sound, but also uh, bass hits uh, and bass drops. And I'm going to, as I play the song, I'm going to demonstrate to you what I mean by the bass hits and the bass drops. Uh, another one of the hallmarks of Dirty South Rap would be very simplistic uh, mel melodic loop. So by this time, we're not so much sampling entire records from the disco and the funk era. There's just like a little piece 
of like, perhaps one bit of the melody that continues to loop over and over while the rapper just raps over the music. Also, you'll have Southern Black American accents, the accent which sounds quite a bit different than Black Americans who are from California or from New York. Many of these same characteristics that I just uh, mentioned for Dirty South Rap are utilized and uh, transformed to the extreme to, into what soon becomes trap music. So if you've ever listened to trap music, you'll recognize how close it is to the style of Crank That, which, was, which is what we're about to watch right now. Bass drop. Bass drop. These are the bass hits. So by 2010 to now, what you have is hip hop culture evolving from the earlier four elements that I talked about, MC, DJ, break dancing, um, and graffiti, to a much greater emphasis on musical style and fashion, and a stronger antagonism between so-called conscious rap, uh, which is rapping more about serious issues like politics and identity, and uh, really serious issues of daily life, and highly commercialized slash lyrically superficial rap, where people are just rapping about money and drugs and sex and whatever, just really superficial top layer kind of things. Uh, currently, mumble rap uh, is the highest uh, form of pop cultural relevance at this moment. In terms of conscious rap, uh, however, Right now, most rappers are t celebrating and up uplifting unapologetic black identity. So here's an example of some conscious rap uh, that was produced in this year. It's called Black by the rapper Buddy featuring ASAP Ferg. Um, the things or the items with special meaning, these words and phrases that are highlighted in yellow have sp particularly special meanings and it allows the listener to understand how much of a conscious rap this rap is. I can go into a, a further ex, uh, explanation of these items in yellow in the question and answer period. Uh, for now, I'll give you a few seconds to just glance over these lyrics and then I'll play the song. Okay. And so now that we have a very, very fast, uh, fast and loose, 
understanding of the history of hip hop culture in the United States, we can now move on to hip hop history in Mongolia. So the history that I just gave, even though it was a brief overview introduction, it's very well documented in terms of mass media and academic sources from articles to dissertations to books to whatever media that you can think of, someone has done it about hip hop culture in the United States. This is not the case for hip hop culture in Mongolia in terms of readily accessible uh, academic or mass media sources in terms of understanding the history of hip hop in Mongolia. Therefore, in order to actually understand the history of hip hop in Mongolia, you have to talk to Mongolians. You have to talk to and interact with and learn from the movers and shakers, the progenitors and the actors of hip hop culture here in Mongolia. This is my project here. Um, what I've gathered so far is that there is a general timeline of progression in terms of the development of hip hop culture in Mongolia. So hip hop culture in Mongolia can be thought of as thought of in a sense of three distinct generations. The first generation being from about 1990 to 1995. Right after the uh, democratic revolution, more cultural products were being imported into Mongolia. Although other foreign genres like rock and pop had already been trickling into Mongolia at this time, they began to flood in through CDs and MTV in the early 90s. And old school hip hop from America was part of that flood. So there were two music groups in the first that defined the first generation. Um, that would be Khartas uh, and uh, Kharsarnai. Khartas mean black condor and Kharsarnai meaning black rose. Uh, the people that I've talked to generally would describe Khartas as the real first hip hop group, while Kharsarnai is more like techno rap. And I've listened to some of their music and it really is more like electronic music with some rapping in it. So I understand that sentiment. It's important also to note that hip hop dance crews came to greater prominence than MCs and DJs in Mongolia uh, at this time. So the musical style of Kartas, as well as the fashion style and the featuring of graffiti hip hop culture was inspired by old school American hip hop, that is hip hop of the 80s in the US, particularly Public Enemy. So what I'm going to do is play Khartas' Bukhr Tengir, which means like cloudy sky, generally speaking. And I want you guys to watch the video and note the similarities between what's going on in this video and what's going on in Public Enemy's uh, Fight the Power, which was produced in 1989. And now, uh, public enemies fight the power.
That was the first generation. The second generation of Mongolian hip hop can be defined at about 1995 to the year 2000. These are general time markers, by the way. They're not hard and fast rules, but this is generally how you can understand Mongolian hip hop in the second generation. They were defined by five hip hop dance grooves that came out in about 1995. That would be Dan Ba Inch, which is War and Peace, Lumino, Mantarep, Inch Chalo, which means freedom, and Hoyer Ho, which means uh, two brothers. Originally, these groups all operated together as part of a hip hop dance scene. Remember when I said that dance crews, break dancing was far more prominent in Mongolian early hip hop culture than just emceeing and DJing. But over about a year or so, many of the members uh, switched from mainly dancing to actually rapping and singing. And the scene split up into the individual hip hop groups that we understand them to be uh, today. Ice Top and Digital, uh, who came out in about the late 90s, can be understood as part of a sort of second phase of the second generation. In terms of musical style, the second generation, they tended to, uh, to take inspiration from the 90s era hip hop of uh, American hip hop culture. Less old school and more underground, although gangster rap style didn't start becoming really popular in Mongolian hip hop culture until closer to the year 2000. During uh, the course of my research, I came across Lumino's uh, Geralt Horvod, uh, which kind of means like, bright world or bright life. Um, although the song came out after the 95 to, 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 to 2000 period, still it was very similar to the style, the musical style of the hip hop group Bone Thugs and Harmony of the late 90s. Uh, I'm going to play both of these songs and I want you all to listen to these similarities. It will be very readily apparent uh, once I play. So here is Geralt Horvath first. <laughs> Here is Bone Thugs and Harmonies, The Crossroads, that was produced in 1996. Now, in term, going back to hip hop history in Mongolia, there was a dip in popularity in hip hop music in the early 2000s, uh, very much in the same way that there was a dip in popularity in uh, American hip hop culture. The reason for this is that most artists would focus on mild slash safe subject matter, primarily love songs. So people were starting to get bored with the content, even though it was a new musical style, like, okay, I can listen to pop music if I want to listen to love songs. So by the mid-2000s, hip-hop music artists, Mongolian hip-hop music artists, started talking about riskier subject matter, like politics, like the air pollution in UB, and daily life in UB, in Ulaanbaatar. These artists include Durftgar uh, Hesek, uh, which means Four Corners, uh, Click Click Boom, G, Jinny, and Tsetse. Uh, this generation, the third generation, were the first to start using curse words in their lyrics, especially G. 
Uh, and because they criticized the government, they started facing backlash and mild threats of censorship by government officials. So this is how the hip hop revival came about in Mongolia, where the hip hop revival in America, if you remember, was through Dirty South Rap. Uh, hip hop music overcame the popularity lag in thus in this new way, new subject matter, the, adapt, uh, the adoption of the gangster rap style. Um, it completely skips the dirty South rap style into trap music style. Currently, uh, Mongolian hip hop is at the trap music phase um, with artists such as Gijin and Bisma. So this clip that I'm going to show you is Gijin. Uh, this was at the M-Chart Laser Show on September 9th of this year. Um, the Laser Show was sort of a general music festival where lots of different artists from different genres were coming to perform. Most of the people in the crowd were younger Mongolians, about late teens or early 20s. Um, I and my husband were like the two only foreigners there. Um, it was held at Nottam Stadium. It was at night. It was open air concert. Uh, it was a little chilly, but it was a really interesting show. Uh, most of the Mongolian hip hop artists, music artists that I've talked to so far, have described the current state of Mongolian hip hop as a split between conscious rappers and commercialized rappers. The latter rapping about superficial things like money and sex. Uh, several of those people that I talked to put Genjin into this particular category of the commercialized set. So what you're about to hear is a little clip of uh, their music, um, one of their songs that they performed during their set at the laser show. Get money, get money, get money. He says, get money, get money, and then get honeys. So money, sex. Interesting to note that right after this, uh, this moment where I cut off the clip, the speakers blew out at the concert because the music was so loud and they had the bass turned all the way up that the left stage speakers completely blew out. And so they spent half of their set uh, with an unbalanced music system. That's how loud it was. This is, again, this element of trap music that comes straight from Dirty South Rap when I talked about how there's lots and lots of bass. Um, they take it to the extreme. Why did I go through these histories, and especially in comparing Mongolian hip hop history to American hip hop history? The reasons why I did this is because Mongolian hip hop history, Mongolian hip hop artists take directly from American hip hop artists. So it's important to understand these comparisons. Uh, the hip hop histories together have some similarities, but there are key differences because hip hop isn't indigenous to Mongolia. So in the first, uh, this first row that you see here, uh, the American hip hop history goes from disco to underground to gangsta rap to commercialized rap, dirty south trap to today conscious versus commercial rap. On the Mongolian side, you have underground, commercial rap, gangsta, trap, and then uh, conscious versus commercial rap, what we have now. Um, despite taking cues from American hip hop, Mongolian hip hop developed the four hip hop uh, cultural elements differently. In American hip hop, there was a general equal importance of MCs, DJs, B-boys, and graffiti, but that shifted to um, more focus on rappers specifically in fashion. Whereas in Mongolia, as I mentioned, the dancing was more important. So you had more emphasis on b-boys and generally MCs and fashion. 
But then the culture changed or shifted to a focus more on the rappers, DJs in particular, and continuing a focus on b-boys. Currently, commercial rap subject matter is about the same between American and Mongolian styles, um, as I talked about the superficial lyrics that they're talking about. For conscious rap, however, the differences are obvious, but key to how hip hop has become indigenized in Mongolia. So for conscious rap in America, uh, the subject matter is about black identity, black American identity as an oppressed minority and the issues and thoughts and feelings that come from living as a black American in the United States. Conscious rap in uh, Mongolian hip hop culture, however, it focuses on pride of Mongolian identity, pride of Shingis Khan, pride of the natural scenery, the grasslands, the eagles, and pride of families, mothers, and children, and this kind of thing. And also criticizing inept leaders, particularly in Ulaanbaatar, where hip hop culture is more, is most concentrated in Mongolia. Um, this is, these are the differences between the conscious rap styles. As you can see, these ideas or subject matter that are coming into conscious rap between American rap and Mongolian rap is precisely because of the viewpoints in life that these two different groups of people are coming from. And so while rap and hip hop culture is indigenous to the United States, how Mongolian people have taken those elements but have turned it and modified it and constructed it to fit their own culture and their own ideas and their own perspective on life makes hip hop culture indigenized in Mongolia. So now it's a legitimate own form of uh, music and culture. So now I want to talk about contemporary Mongolian hip hop culture now that I've gone through the history. First in relation to the four elements of hip hop and then about the culture in general. Um, right now, uh, hip hop culture is extremely popular when it comes to b-boy uh, girl or break dancing. Uh, as I said, this popularity has continued on through the history of Mongolian hip hop. It consists of freestyle competitions, dance schools, dance lessons, and commercial advertisement slash production. Uh, sometimes hip hop dance crews or oftentimes hip hop dance crews are requested to perform at various events, such as the MTART laser show where Genjin was at. Remember that it was a show for lots of different artists from many different genres. It was not just a hip hop show, but Genjin was there and there was also a dance, a hip hop dance crew there performing in between sets of music. This particular clip is from the Groove Improve Battle event, which took place on August 26th of this year. Uh, it was sponsored by the Moxie Brothers Dance Studio, uh, which the, for the founders of this studio were originally students of the 116 Dance Studio here in Ulaanbaatar. As an uh, interesting side note, I'm currently taking their hip hop foundations class. Um, and I will be start taking their, uh, their dance hall slash twerk class starting on October 20th. Yes, it, it exists. So if you're interested, uh, let, let me know. I can give you the information. So here is some video that I took from that event. There were about 30 or so participants who were uh, battling for a title of the, you know, the winner of the whole event. And they were set up in one-on-one -on -one kind of matches. There were mostly young Mongolian men, but there were a few uh, Mongolian women 
there who were really holding their own in these dance competitions. Uh, another interesting side note, especially in relation to what I'm about to talk about next, is that the DJ for this <coughs> event was Borjo, who's a very famous uh, Mo uh, Mongolian hip hop DJ here in Ulaanbaatar. So when I say that the dancing and the DJ aspect of Mongolian hip hop is more important, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, in terms of emceeing, using your words, your lyrics, and DJing the music. Uh, we've covered much of this in the details in, in, about when I went over the Mongolian history um, in terms of subject matter and musical style. What I want to emphasize instead here is the dynamic between cultural borrowing and cultural restructuring. That Mongolian hip hop artists borrowed and copied from American artists in the past is obvious as we've covered, but this process of borrowing and copying is still continuing today. Mongolian hip hop artists and movers and shakers in the community are still looking at American progression and taking bits and pieces from uh, those influences. There are distinctly Mongolian elements in Mongolian rap. For example, rappers rap mostly in Mongolian. Uh, sometimes they'll have a little sprinkle of English words, but it's mostly Mongolian. Many rappers talk explicitly about Mongolian identity, like Chinggis Khan, the beautiful nature, the importance of family, etc. Some rappers wear traditional Mongolian clothes in their music videos or at uh, events like this rapper here is doing. Or they throat sing or feature traditional Mongolian instruments in their music. Most rappers, though, seem to follow American stylistic cues in terms of music and lyrics. This process of borrowing and copying, though, should not be looked at as a negative or derivative kind of thing. For remember that early hip hop did exactly that with mixing and borrowing from Caribbean culture, from the Jamaican dance hall, speaker culture, to toasting, etc., in musical styles. American hip hop would not exist without borrowing slash copying and then restructuring to make an entirely new thing. This is what makes Mongolian hip hop in, in indigenized culture. In terms of uh, hip hop graffiti culture in Mongolia, there is definitely some uh, graffiti around uh, Ulaanbaatar, but there's not as much as I would expect or not as much compared to other major cities that I've seen graffiti in the United States. I'm not entirely sure why this is, and this is something that I will be looking to find an answer to as I continue my research. Nevertheless, <coughs> here are some photos of graffiti near my apartment in Bayankul. That's my favorite one. Uh, in terms of this picture here, this is actually a tattoo parlor near my apartment and you can see the beautiful graffiti and art around the whole door. It's like the only building on that block that is that decorated in that fashion. Uh, today, earlier today, I went to uh, the, uh, uh, the Narnituch Bridge that's at the intersection of Narnituch and Nar uh, Narnizam. Uh, there is some beautiful graffiti there. And so I took a little bit of time to take some pictures of that and I actually just added it into this presentation. So I'm just going to show a few of these pictures. This is actually uh, on the way to the bridge if you're walking from here and then go south. Um, you'll see this on the right hand side of the street. Um, this is a cafe and a bar. And there was, I won't necessarily call this graffiti but it's definitely street art. And I found it particularly beautiful. And that's the better angle of the picture itself. And here you have some tagging on that building. Now here is the graffiti art that uh, can be viewed from the other side of the bridge. And then I walked closer and got some better pictures. I love the colors and the bold uh, lines and curves here. This is a close up. You can see some tagging near the little pencil on the right hand side. And some more tagging by the same artist. Right above that area in the kind of 
like right under the bridge, you'll see some more tagging and I guess love notes. Now, the graffiti is spread not just on the underside of the bridge, but to the side of the bridge. It does continue uh, well into these weeds slash grassy area. Just a little bit more tagging. Looking across the street uh, south, you, there are, there's even more tagging and uh, graffiti on the other side of the street on the pillars under the bridge. What I find very interesting about uh, the graffiti that I've seen so far is how there are distinct Mongolian elements included in some of these, for instance, horses. And also, if you look towards the left of the second line, it says bun bun, the second bun on the left near the B, it says winter is coming. I thought that was apt. <laughs> Lots of spray painting and then tagging. In this picture, I want to see. So you see horses, 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 more horses. And also the Mongolian flag symbol right up here. Uh, I feel that this, these kinds of things add to the validity that hip hop culture is indigenized in Mongolia. It's its own thing, it's its own special thing. It's not just a copy of American hip hop culture. Uh, there's some more tagging here and here is a better view of this particular tag that I thought was very beautiful. In terms of popularity and presence. Those were the four elements of hip hop as far as it existed in Mongolia. Now I wanna talk about how, about the culture in general currently. Hip hop culture in Mongolia had to carve a space for itself in broad popular culture. At first the style and dances were seen as vulgar and abrasive, but artists fought for acceptance and now you can hear rap music played regularly on the radio and in restaurants. You'll see hip hop dancing at various events and on TV commercials. And you'll see hip hop street fashion popularized in ads and stores. The same exact thing in terms of carving out a space, being underground and subversive and now is a popular thing. The exact same thing happened in the United States. In addition to mainstream popularity, there is a vibrant underground scene where current artists and so-called old heads collaborate regularly to maintain a strong core of Mongolian hip hop culture and to teach its true history and deep meanings. Mongolian hip hop is prominent both in Mongolia and internationally, uh, including China, Korea, Japan, Europe, and even the United States. Several Mongol rap artists have collaborated with popular American rap artists and several popular American rap artists have been invited to, uh, invited by Mongol rap artists to perform in Mongolia. In this digital age, Mongolian hip hop culture has a massive social media presence, massive, uh, from Instagram to YouTube to Facebook. With Facebook in particular, there are dozens and dozens of hip hop interest groups, professional pages, and online advertisements, making it easier for more people to quickly access Mongolian hip hop culture. Now, when it comes to Mongolian hip hop and the diaspora, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned how I, kind, I learned about the kind of antagonism between Mongols here and Mongols in China. When I ask Mongols here how, about how they feel about inner Mongolians, every answer is different. Some people will talk about the accent, how Mongolian spoken in inner Mongolia is different in terms of accent than Mongolian spoken here is a slightly older version of it. And sometimes people find it weird or funny. Some people will talk about Chinese influence, uh, especially in terms of Chinese politics and how they treat Mongolians in Inner Mongolia. Uh, and some other people will go further and mention or continue to talk about the political situation there in terms of how Inner Mongolians aren't, are in a sense, forced into a particular kind of worldview, lest they be uh, questioned or punished by the Chinese government. 
due to how the Chinese government deals with political unrest. Most of the people that I talk to will say that we're all Mongols. Regardless of all these uh, differences, a lot of the people that I talk to, a lot of the Mongolians I will talk to when asked about, how do you feel about Inner Mongolians? We're all Mongolians. There are Buryat Mongolians, there are Khalq Mongolians, there are Inner Mongolians, we're all Mongolians. Some of the people I've talked to would say that the younger Mongols are the group of people who are changing the way Mongolian society thinks about Inner Mongolians. Instead of this kind of antagonistic relationship, it's the younger Mongolians who are developing a more amiable and brotherly relationship. So what role do the arts play in this? From my research, from the research that I've done, traditional arts tend to exacerbate the strained relationship while modern and contemporary arts tend to relax the uh, relationship. What I mean by that is that Mongolians here tend to be more protective and prideful and filled with pride in, uh, about traditional Mongolian um, arts, especially music and visual arts and things like the riding saddle and the Nadam games. Because of how Mongolia and China are in a cultural negotiation with each other, they have economic relationship so it's a very complex relationship between the Mongolian government and the Chinese government on down to individual Mongolians and how they feel about China claiming certain Mongolian traditional aspects as Chinese. So when it comes to traditional Mongolian cultural products, Mongolians here stake their claim and plant their flag. This is the real Mongolia. This is the real Mongolian culture, et cetera, et cetera. But for contemporary arts, especially in music, rock and pop and hip hop, those kind of distinctions start to get to relaxed and people are more likely to collaborate with each other. Mongolians here collaborating and going to Inner Mongolia and saying, you know, However, we're dealing with these politics. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all Mongolians. This, we should love each other and support one another. And so far, I found that intentional Mongolian and inner Mongolian collaboration in music is not unique to hip hop. At first, when I was doing this research, it seemed that way, but it actually isn't unique to hip hop. There is collaboration going on. Uh, between Mongolians and inner Mongolians in the pop world and the rock world and even the metal world. But what is happening, which I guess was what I was seeing at first, is that hip hop music seems to provide the most consistent and fruitful means for doing so. Why is this? It's because of the nature of how hip hop developed and the purpose that it tends to serve. It serves as an outlet for expressing one's true feelings. A lot of the people, the Mongolians that I've talked to from people who just listen to hip hop music, to dancers, to producers, to artists, they will all say that they can express themselves better in hip hop, better, more honestly, more truthfully, in a more gritty way that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for pop and rock styles. You could do it, but hip hop, for whatever reasons, allows a much broader ground to do so. And so with hip hop music, this relationship between Mongolians and inner Mongolians fosters a brotherly sense of being. So here's where I'm at currently. I need further investigation obviously. Um, I need to go to more dance classes. I need to talk to more people. I need to investigate record shops around Ulaanbaatar. I need to buy more CDs and books. I need to do more research. That's what I intend to do. But it's not just about me. Remember when I said that documentation of hip hop culture about, uh, from Mongolia is, is very few. There's not much out there. There are some things and a lot of it is dated. And so there needs to be an update and I can't do it alone. This topic is huge. The culture changes so fast and there needs to be far much more investigation into this topic and about Ulaanbaatar lifestyle in general. Um, where I'm at right now is that I'm understanding Ulaanbaatar lifestyle as a legitimately Mongolian uh, 
process, a legitimately Mongolian topic of study. And I am coming to understand that Ulaanbaatar studies is something that I would be interested in helping develop even more uh, beyond it, the point where it is right now. There's a lot of things going on with Ulaanbaatar studies. Uh, much of it is surrounded about surrounding the air pollution problem. But even with that, there needs to be much more investigation about the arts, the art scene around Ulaanbaatar. It's fantastic, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's varied, and it's huge. Some more questions that I have for Mongolia while I'm still here. I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but I will be here until November. And in November, I will be going to China and I'll be spend, spending November, December, finishing up my research from the Chinese uh, Mongolian point of view. But while I'm still here, I still have some questions about Mongolian hip hop culture. Uh, the Caribbean trend that I've seen uh, in Mongolia, it's very interesting. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the twerking slash dance hall class that I intend to sign up for in October. There is quite a bit of Latin American interest among Mongols in Mongolia. And I'm not sure about how much, has been, how much research has been done into fleshing out this uh, new trend in popularity. I wanna know where this Caribbean trend will go and if more hip hop artists will start to incorporate Caribbean and maybe African, actually like sub-Saharan African musical hip hop styles in a similar way that hip hop artists were starting to do in America in about the late 2000s before 2010. And one of the main questions or set of questions that I have about Mongolia still is that given hip hop's potential in China's further cultural expansions, expansion as a superpower, will artists in Mongolia make more efforts through their art to include inner Mongolians? Is that even a priority for Mongolian hip hop artists? And should it be a priority for Mongolian hip hop artists? I don't have answers to these questions. So what, while I'm still here, I'm going to be gathering as much information as I can to try and come to some kind of answer. What I'll be looking for in China is a Mongolian hip hop history in China. As I did, as I found one here, I want to find what it is there. Uh, I want to find the artists and the cornerstones of the Mongolian hip hop community in China. I want to see how they develop and interpret the four hip hop elements uh, from a Mongolian in China point of life view. And I want to know their views of Mongolia as a kind of imagined homeland, as a kind of place where they have a home. This is where their ancestors came from, but most of them probably won't ever be able to visit Mongolia. So I want to know how they view uh, Mongolia and Mongolians in their conscious or subconscious mind and what it means to them as Mongolians living in China. This has been my presentation. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you.